Dungeons and Daddies is a rowdy, horny, violent podcast for grown-ups. Content warnings can be found in the episode description. I don't know why adventuring groups don't hire like a second healer. I just feel like it would solve a lot of the arguments that we've been hearing. Welcome to You're Wrong About, the podcast where the fantasies are real, but your memories are not. Ooh, very prescient to today's topic. Hi, I'm Sarah Marshland, and I'm writing a book about the Albert Scare. I'm Michael Hobbit. I work at the Huffington Post, which is a large wooden pole in the ground that keeps a dragon named Huffington tethered. So today is part three into our deep dive on the Glenn Close trial. But before we get to that, I just wanted to point out, uh, I was looking through some transcripts, and it turns out that one of the big pieces of contention in the trial, uh, whether or not Glenn was okay with his son smoking pot, uh, is actually uh, inaccurate. So to debunk it, if you actually go back to the very first episode, it's kind of clear that Nick doesn't actually know how to smoke pot, and Glenn is trying to stop him, which is the oh. opposite of what is conveyed in the trial. Well, Glenn didn't really dissuade the idea of Nick smoking pot, so it's kind of his own fault there. Why don't you tell me what you know about the jury selection process for this trial? Okay, I know a lot about this, actually is that there were 13. I think that the deliberations themselves took two weeks, very intense deliberating on this case. Right, yeah, it was completely anonymous. Nobody knew who they were. So with all of that table setting out of the way, do you want to talk about the verdict? Yes, please. Welcome to Dungeons and Daddies, not a BDSM podcast, actually a thrilling courtroom drama D&D podcast about four dads from our world flung into the Forgotten Realms in a quest to rescue their lost sons. My name is Freddie Wong, and I play Glenn Close, the rock and roll bar dad, and today is the day Glenn Close learns his fate. This is not If you had Glenn's the chance to close your fate, would you? <laughs> <laughs> this is not Glenn's first run in with the court system. Mm. So he was touring around outside of Modesto, one of the outdoor malls in Modesto. He met a guy who was like, hey, I like your Christmas music. It's kind of funny. We look like each other. And then Glenn was like, perfect. So this guy who he nicknames <laughs> mm-hmm. the Sandman. So Glenn and the Sandman. <laughs> so here's how his scam with the Sandman works. Because Glenn and the Sandman <laughs> bear a somewhat close resemblance, mm-hmm. they both agree to be contacts for each other in case any one of them ever runs a red light and then they get a picture taken of them. Glenn goes into court and protests the charge and says, I wasn't driving that van. That's my friend when I lent it to him. That's the Sandman driving. And he shows the picture of the Sandman and it's enough reasonable doubt that it's not him. That he doesn't get the ticket. But doesn't the Sandman then have to get the ticket? They don't just no, forget. They're no, like, well, you, someone else broke the law. We'll forget about it. No, right? literally. And you can do that. I have never done this, but I did this for somebody else because I told them about it. But like, basically, you were the Sandman. I was the Sandman. Um, so if you get a ticket at a red light camera and you go online and you see the picture, at least in Arizona, you could literally just check off. I am not the person driving. <laughs> and like, <laughs> you're out of it, basically. Yeah, they're not going to go investigate. They're not going to go find the Sandman for a 50 I think there was ticket. even an option that like I do not know the person who's driving or something like this. This is how fucking square I am that I was like no well like the CSI crime lab would clearly be on your case about that. Enhance. Enhance. What, the, what about the polygraph? Wouldn't they you know do a facial scan or something like that Freddie? Wow. Yeah. Alright. Well hi everybody. <laughs> hi everybody. I'm Daryl Wilson. I'm a stay at home coach dad. Uh, who You're Daryl Wilson? Daryl Wilson. Damn. Daryl Wilson. What did I say? Are you going method on us? Whoa. What, what happened? Is Daryl joining oh, did the I say podcast? I'm Daryl Wilson. You Hi, everybody. Yeah, you <laughs> hey, everybody. This is Daryl Wilson. Uh, Matt's not here today, but uh, you know <laughs> me. I'm the fictional character. Uh, it was a stay at home coach dad who became Jesus Christ. Let's start this over. Hi, everybody. You I'm Matthew Arnold. Jesus Christ? <laughs> <laughs> hey, this, this is Christmas. our Christmas episode, after all. <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Matthew Arnold. I play Daryl Wilson. I'm a stay-at-home coach dad who uh, becomes a barbarian You're a when he stay-at-home enters- coach dad <laughs> who became a barbarian when he enters the Forgotten Realm. So, unfortunately, I kind of uh, got through my five senses. That was a good ten weeks of easy. Yeah, dad that was facts. a good grift. I wanted to reward the audience for that bullshit of five senses by giving them a good dad fact that was also educational. And the fact is that we do actually have two other senses: vestibular and proprioceptive which are six and seven senses. And I'm going to talk about what are Daryl's favorite and least favorite versions of those senses. <laughs> All right. So yes, on. there are other senses. I'm oh, so down no. to learn. 
This is like fucking 99% invisible over here. I'm on radio This is some good lab. shit. So the vestibular sense is the sense of... Sex. It's the sense of... Well, it would, <laughs> it would happen during sex. It's essentially your inner ear senses. It's how we feel acceleration. It's how we feel balance. Vertigo. So that is a sense. I guess it depends on what you're doing during sex. Yes. Wow. So Daryl's favorite vestibular sense is the feeling that the beast gives him when he accelerates. So he'll never wow. feel that again. The minivan nice. gave him the well, precise don't, never feeling. never say never. You, Odyssey song could still be out there. I just want to throw this out there. Have it own the analog of Odyssey song, that's a zero to 60 in like 14.2 <laughs> <It> seconds. It feels <laughs> like <laughs> such a slow acceleration. The feeling of your son being safe in the backseat is what it is. So <laughs> it's the best feeling for Daryl. Freddie, do you really fucking think that Daryl did not put a Hemi in that bad boy? <laughs> that thing's probably Hemied <laughs> so up, heavy. dude. I'll he tell you the real <laughs> feeling that Daryl probably reacts is the feeling of knowing there's six cup holders within arm's reach of the driver's <laughs> seat in a Honda Odyssey. Okay, That's five a of them are filled with liquefied Charleston shoes. Freddie, you just got the seventh sense, but I'll get there in a second. I can't <laughs> believe you called this out. <laughs> <laughs> so his least favorite version of it is he just hates getting dizzy. He can't stand any sort of dizzy rides. The teacups at Disneyland are his least favorite. So mm-hmm. that would be um, vestibular. He hates the feeling of vertigo. Dude, I bet you Daryl yarfed in a teacup once and ruined Disneyland. He yarfs all the time. Whoa. So the seventh sense, proprioceptive, is essentially sex. you. is sex. Yes, it's also sex. <laughs> <laughs> but I think most senses, you feel all seven senses when you're having sex. I would know. We've been in quarantine for a year now. <laughs> <laughs> Please, somebody vestibular me. (laughs) I'm done. Okay, go ahead. Proprioceptive is essentially how you know where you are in 3D space. So, like, if you close your eyes, you can know where your hand is. Mm -hmm. It's the feeling of your muscles. So, your muscles, you know where your muscles are bent because of senses in your muscles. So, Daryl's favorite proprioceptive is every time he grabs his big gulp from the center console without looking. (laughs) It's like that perfect feeling. Pure instinct. It's the pure instinct, the muscle memory of knowing every aspect of his life. He and the car have become one. He can feel the curves of the car, the muscles of the car, and his muscles. Muscles are united in a symphony. And his least favorite is he can't Sex. type without looking <laughs> because he has big sausage fingers. So it's not really a proprioceptive <laughs> thing, but he can't type without looking and he blames it on his muscle memory. But it's just because he's got two big fingers. <laughs> Got big sausage. What about those little bumps on the F and J key? Doesn't he hone himself on those? No, he just doesn't. He just hates. He's got to look. He's one of those digit typers. His fingers have an area of effect damage. (laughs) How's Daryl's texting game? That must be brutal on a phone. He doesn't text. He calls. He calls his son. Yeah, he calls. He's a man who never responds. Someone instead will. God, yeah. Daryl, don't text. There are no texts from Daryl on either Carol's or Grant's phone. It's always a text and a lot of voicemail. A lot of a lot of unlistened to voicemails. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of hey son give me a call every single time grant answers the phone he's like is it an emergency <laughs> and just, no, just, no, i just want to talk you asked me how i was doing oh my god <laughs> my heart skipped a beat hey everyone i'm will campo so i play the fictional character henry oak on the podcast dungeons and daddies henry is a birkenstock rock and crunchy munchy hippie nature druid granola dad and my uh, dad fact about henry this week is that henry still has every t-shirt he's ever owned. He's never thrown a t-shirt out. <laughs> because Man. like in the Forgotten Realms, like in Oakvale, it was a big deal, your clothes, right? Like you bonded with them and it was like part of who you were. So like he, the idea of throwing your clothes out is like anathema to him. It was very traumatizing when he came to our world and he was wandering around the forest naked for a couple of days. So like when he got his clothes in our world, it was a big deal. So the first t-shirt he ever got, which he oh. still has, is one that Mercedes Oak Garcia's brother, Ricky, sells t-shirts. He's like an online Online vendor and he has a t-shirt you're dropping a character as important as ricky just out of nowhere in the middle of a dad fact <laughs> this is some serious we gotta update the wikipedia right now all right i'm my mind's blown we got ricky ricky garcia so ricky sells t-shirts online and he has a t-shirt that says vegans give a cluck because it's supposed to be like vegans don't eat animals so that they, yeah, I get the it. shirt didn't make sense. So he didn't <laughs> sell a lot of them. So that was his first shirt. It said vegans give a cluck. And once he learned what a vegan was, he was like, oh, that's what I am. I give a cluck. So that's his shirt. That's his uh, it's his favorite shirt. He became vegan off of a shirt. random no, no, t-shirt no, he, he was, got. No, he <laughs> He's That's so how gullible. good this t-shirt was. He was like, soul. God, it could have been any shirt. <laughs> he already didn't eat animals, but this spoke to him. He's like, this shirt is like how I will choose to express it myself spoke? to the world. It actually talked to him? Hey. This is what it feels like when Will is interrupting Matt while he's doing that back. It's not funny when you do it, Matthew. It's funny when I do it to you. Will, I have a question. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. When someone like sees Henry wearing this shirt and they're like, I don't, sorry, can you explain your shirt? I don't understand what that means. How does Henry explain it? 
Uh, well, he says that it's supposed to be like that vegans care and it's a fu- he just is very literal and obvious about it because he's like, you know, it's like it's a fun play on like a naughty word. But a cluck is the sound a chicken makes and like vegans care about chickens. So, you know, vegans give a cluck. <laughs> Hi, my name is Beth May and I play Ron Stampler, emotionally detached stepfather and rogue. Fun fact about Ron this week. I don't know. Did Growing up, did any of you, your parents have like <laughs> laws that weren't actual laws, but they told you that were laws because they didn't want you to do things? My mom told me that it was illegal in California to stand in front of the microwave. What? <laughs> and, you know, in hindsight, I'm like, well, probably wasn't. <laughs> you'll go to hell if you masturbate does that count (laughs) and i think my mom also had one like you can't have any screens in the car so she didn't like because i was like asking for like a portable dvd player or something my parents said that like the lights has to be off because the cops will pull you over here like interior lights are on oh yeah that's actually i think that's probably true though Maybe. No, no, I don't know. It's I don't not. know. No, but if you get your friend Sandman to say that he turned the lights on, then you can get <laughs> exactly. out of Sandman, hit well, the lights. So wrapping this into my dad fact is I think that Ron has his own series of in context, pretty sad laws that he doesn't know are not actually laws. Like, oh, no. it's illegal to look in your dad's briefcase. It's illegal to ask your dad oh, where no. he's going. Oh, <laughs> like, so, no. um, this is so sad. I know. It, maybe it's too dark, but that's just what I was thinking of. When I was really young, my mom tried to convince me that you literally can't have sex until you're married. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> you don't want to embarrass yourself, Wait, honey. Like, it just true? doesn't happen. Is that not true? No. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was a young boy, my father took me into the city to see oh, a marching boy. band. He said, someday, okay. when you grow up, you'll be the savior of, I don't remember the rest of it. <laughs> All the cool people who listen to this podcast got that joke. All right, let's move Welcome on. Welcome to the dad parade, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anthony Birch. I'm a uh, non-fictional character on Dungeons and Daddies. So Glenn is on trial for some crimes that he did, and I feel like it's a little bit whoa, hypocritical whoa, whoa. of me to put Some crimes he was alleged to do, Anthony. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, but be careful. Well, this is a pretty unreal. You might be guilty <laughs> until proven innocent here. Yeah, so Glenn's on trial for some crimes he may ha- or may not have committed, and I feel <laughs> Freddy, like... Freddie's not on trial on Twitter. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like it was a little bit unfair to do that without... Like, who am I to stand in judgment of Glenn? So I wanted to make a confession, which is that when I was, I believe, 15 or 16, in the year 2004 or 2005... My favorite television show was Entourage. <gasps> Uh-oh. And oh, yeah. I'm, so- I'm sorry. Oh, wow. And then eventually I grew up. I was like, oh, this is just porn for douchebags. This is porn for awful <laughs> porn people. For this douche isn't bags. anything. But it just reminded me because Matt had mentioned he hated every character on that show. Wanted them to immediately go down. You know what? I'll be honest. I know I'm not going to let you stand out there for no reason. I definitely, in college, I watched some of Entourage. And I'd say, you know what? I think everybody liked Entourage the first season or two. And then over time, we were like, you know what? This isn't good. Because it was an incredibly popular show. And I got out of it yeah. probably about like season two or season three. And now it's unwatchable. But Same. every man starts to hate Entourage the moment he realizes he won't be as successful as the people in Entourage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This show yeah, sucks. It's just, it's it's just for, resentful. It's for toxic dude bros. I mean, no, it does suck though. Okay, that's brave though, Anthony. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very selfless. <laughs> to summarize briefly, the last two episodes have seen the trial of Glenn Close, which takes place in Meth Bay, the judge, Honorable Judge Bill Close presiding. At the end of the last episode, everybody had finished their closing arguments, and it was up to the jury to decide. And the jury was in real life made up of 13 jurors from our official Discord. They were all given email invitations to a private Discord, were asked to anonymize their names, so all they went by was juror and their number. And for the last two weeks, they have been debating the individual arguments put forth by the prosecution and the defense, as well as the two overall charges, Glenn is a bad person and Glenn is a bad dad. And they came together and made some votes on the individual arguments. After the previous episode, you all went back to the Meth Bay Supermax. You tried to sleep. And hey, um, Peyton, can I just quick? I just has a question for you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, hey, Glenn, what are you going to say to Peyton? Oh, right. All right. Sorry, Daryl. Yeah, you know what? You can come in on this one, okay. too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Team huddle. I was just, I was just trying to get hey, like, yeah, what's up, guys? You guys <laughs> all having a team huddle? <laughs> Am I missing something? Come on in, man. Yeah, come cool, on in. Cool, Ron, cool. you too. You might as well Rob, get over here. Dad huddle. Guys, I'm in the bathroom. You can't talk to me while Wait. I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> Ron, there's, Ron no, there's no door we can see you. Just, you know, I know, it's fine. I just, We're- I just need a couple more minutes. <laughs> You've been down there all day. Can I roll a perception? I want to see where Ron is going to the bathroom in the cell that has no bathroom. 
It definitely has a I mean, bathroom. It probably has a it's toilet. Got a it's got a toilet. toilet. But Ron is like side saddling it like a Victorian. <laughs> With his legs crossed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely knew there was a bathroom. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Where have you been Daryl, Daryl, there's a bathroom. Oh, no. You know, where have you? No, I know there's a bathroom. I was making a joke about Ron not knowing where the bathroom is. I know oh, there's a bathroom. Baby boy. Oh, no. baby boy. Did you do a boom boom in the corner? <laughs> oh, no. Am I going to have to clean you up? No, nah, definitely not. Peyton, I think uh, Glenn wanted to talk to you. Yeah, no, I know. He's talking to all of us now. Yeah, I guess so. And Ron, you can listen in and throw in your two cents from the, the can over privacy. there. I want privacy. Join in, I guess, when you're good and ready. Um, I just had a question for you guys. Nick said, he said that he liked minions. He's oh. never told me that. Whoa. Has your kids ever... Like hid something from you guys. And Peyton, I wanted to ask you, like, you wouldn't hide something from like your best friend, right? I'm just trying to wrap my head around it all. That's all. I just I can't I don't know what to oh, make I, of I it. I hide things for people all the time. Really, Peyton? Oh yeah. In the, in the orphan fighting league, some of the things that I had to do, I don't like to think about it, but I, I wouldn't want you to think differently about me if I had to tell you about them. Well, but like Nick likes minions, and I kinda do think differently about him, especially the fact <laughs> Maybe that that's he didn't why I didn't tell, tell you. Me. Huh. After that entire trial tonight. You were going to ask the one child of this group about your son liking minions? That's Well, he's the one real dad in this group, I guess. Well, what is that? Excuse me, sir. We're all dads over here. From the next cell over, you hear the bird girl go like, Hey, yeah, you're all dads. What are you sh- shouting at each other about that for? No, no, I don't, mean to, I don't mean to shit on, on your guys' dad skills. It's just that Peyton's already gone through the whole thing once. And I don't know, maybe he's tapped into uh, like previous life dad energy or something. You know, I don't Glenn, know. not to be a backseat therapist over here, but maybe the reason you like confiding in Peyton is because Peyton's a child and he's, you know, he's going to give you an answer that's not really going to challenge your worldview all that much. Peyton tried to like slice my Achilles 10, so I kind <laughs> I don't know that he'll give it to me straight. I tried nonsense. I succeeded. Well, Glenn, you know, I I unfortunately can't relate much to your issue because Lark and Sparrow are usually pretty proud of the stuff that they do that bothers me. So (laughs) sometimes your kids are going to, they're different people and they're, they're beautiful that way. If Nick was this exact same as you, that'd be boring. You know, he's special. Do you want, do you wish Nick was just a clone of you? Like that's not. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. It's just that like, I feel like we're bros. We can like talk about anything. And so for him to like. Glenn. Oh yeah. What's up, Ron? You um, done over there? You gonna well, how do, flush or how flush, to Ron? This, let me think. I don't know how to ask this, but uh, do you have any toilet paper? <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I, I don't. Uh, does it, Go yeah, on uh, then. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm good. <laughs> Ron's gonna be like, I'm just gonna let this dry out. <laughs> oh, and then no. it'll be good. Gosh. <laughs> the only option. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Hold on, Ron. Let me think hard on what kind of spells I have. Maybe I can help. Make, we're not gonna be in this prison up. anymore. You could probably just use the sheet, and I just pull off the sheet, and I just <laughs> talk <laughs> to, to Ron. That's optimistic. Listen, I feel like Glenn was trying to say something important, so maybe handle that, and then I'll see where I'm at. <laughs> all right, but I did throw you a bed sheet. <laughs> So, Thanks. You're welcome. So, Glenn, you're not upset that he likes minions. You're upset that he didn't tell you he liked minions. I guess so, yeah. And how does that make you feel? And then Daryl looks at Henry, like, nodding, like, hey, <laughs> am I doing good? Henry gives <laughs> Daryl, like, a real thumbs I'm doing up. It. Like, I'm doing it. Henry thinks that Daryl and Henry are being so fucking subtle about how they're getting to Glenn's feelings right now. I was like, nice. nice. Like, what are you doing the okay and the thumbs up for between you guys? What are you guys being all cool about? I don't, I don't understand. Just, oh, really you know, excited that's... about Ron getting his toilet paper. Oh, okay. Oh, weird. It's, I mean, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Real quick, just some of my mental pictures, right? Is there just like one bed in the cell and we've all been sharing it? So he's given yes. the sheets for the wow. <laughs> it's like one super large bed that we've all just been like. Yes, yeah, so we're like the grandparents in the Willy Wonka movie. <laughs> yes. God. Okay, good. Just making sure. I don't know. It's just weird to me that he never brought it up before. I guess it makes me feel, uh, I guess it makes me feel like he doesn't trust me. Or I don't know. I guess something like that. Well, I mean, I- hey, give it to me straight, all you guys. Answer at the same time. Okay. Payton, all the dads, just at the same time. What do you think the verdict tomorrow is going to be? On the first count, am I a good person? Three, two, one, go. Guy. Are you asking if, like, I think you're a good person or if they're going to think you're a good person? The next morning. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes, perfect, 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 perfect. So the next morning, you're all dragged back into the courthouse. And at the judge's dais, instead of Bill Close, you see a gelatinous green cube sitting in the chair. The cube, upon all of you lining up, begins to react. It begins to shiver, and then it stretches itself vertically up to the height of a man at sitting position. And slowly, within the cube, you see a little light from a stone at the center of it begin to glow bright, 
and then an image projects outward from the light onto the sheen surface of the cube, like projected. Oh, this is just like how they do Midway Mania. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is exactly how they do Midway Mania. Before you can see the image, you hear a voice that is familiar to all of you, unfortunately to Ron most of all. You hear the voice of Willie Stamper going, <gasps> all right, time to get judged. Ooh, this is the fun part. I whisper, like, I was hoping it was going to be Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> <laughs> So Willie Sampler, the image of him appears on this uh, gelatinous cube and he goes, uh, you ready to hear the verdict? It's going to be fun. Uh, hi, uh, Daryl Wilson. You know, you know me, uh, sir. I do. Um, can I ask a quick question? I'm one of the lawyers, uh, third chair, not the most important, but I just have a quick question for my client. Daryl, it's Willie. He's a mean guy. You don't have to be so nice I to know, him. but I did poorly last time with getting all mad at the judge. So I'm just trying to play it cool. You know, I like you when you're scared. I didn't think I would ever like you, but I'm liking this version of you. I just want to know so that we can prepare for, you know, all the things that will happen after. If he's found innocent, I can kind of assume what happens. If he's found guilty, what is the process? What's going to happen next? I'm actually so glad you asked. I was about to explain that, but I, I, I'm liking oh, this good. dude, Daryl. And then I lean in it's like, guys, I just Shut want to. Shut up. Oh. I'm talking. <laughs> so what's going to happen if you're found innocent, you get to leave. Sure, no problem. Whatever. If you're found guilty, then you get a choice of two possible punishments. I can describe those now. Or I can describe those later. What would you prefer? Guys, what do you want to do? I think now I'm now? just trying to get as much information as possible. Yeah, there's go a ahead and tell. We don't give a shit. We're not going to sit still for your punishments, you big old jerk. You really think you can get out of this? This is um, mwah, mwah, mm. chef kiss. So the two possible punishments are one, death, obviously. And the second is life imprisonment and you lose Nick as your son. He's no longer your son anymore. Whoa. That's not well, possible, that's, sir. Well, that's not, I was, oh, I, yeah, right. I mean, how is that a thing? Is he a stepson? Oh, Bill never explained. Oh, oh, this is, oh, happy birthday to me. That gavel that Bill's been using, that's infused with the chaotic primordial force of law itself. So when he could slam it down and summon people, that's not because he knew a spell to do that. It's just because the gavel had the power to do that. And so when it comes time to punish, it has the power to just immediately make that punishment happen. So in the case of you losing custody of your son, I'll just slam this gavel. I guess I'll make Bill slam the gavel and immediately your son will forget that he was ever your son and a new father for him will appear right next to him and your son will love him and he won't know who the fuck you are. If you choose death, we're gonna have a nice public execution. My friend Radio Lab here is going to take you out into the front and he's gonna burn you alive. The big gold dragon, the bailiff. His name is Raymond Dio Labot. That was a long running joke that I thought oh was gonna get God. paid off here when he was gonna run a meth lab. And we'd be like, this is my Ray Dio Lab, but it didn't work out that <laughs> way. But just so you know, shit. his this name has was- been oh. sitting there the his whole time? His name was always time? supposed to be Radio Lab. <laughs> the whole time? The whole time. You can go back to the the very it. first time I introduced him, I said his name is Raymond Dio Labot, uh, Radio Lab for short. Okay, just wondering, just sort of a question. Uh, where is the gavel? <laughs> Good one, Ron. Henry I gives don't know Ron how many times. Shut up! up! I don't know how many times I have to tell you. Where is the gavel? Sir, don't say it, Ron. Don't say it. Don't I already. Say, thank you. Okay. I mean, I can't. Well, I mean, the gavels with Bill. I didn't think that he necessarily had the cojones to uh, make the judgment if it came down to if he was around for this part. So he's cooling his heels right now. Do you want to hear what the verdicts are? I don't know. Are you gonna shout at us again? <laughs> if you interrupt me, yeah. Well, I don't appreciate being shouted at, sir. Henry, that was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, buddy. I want to say one thing, Daryl. You know, I me, oh me, yeah me. yeah. Just go ahead and this is your whole thing because you're a big old jerk. But I just want. I want you to know that we're not scared of you. And even if you wind up doing a bunch of shitty stuff to us, I'm still not scared of you. We're still not scared of you. And you're a big jerk. And that's all I want to say. The prosecution rests. That's all I got. But yeah, let's go ahead and do this. Yeah, no matter yeah. what happens, we're, Glenn's getting his son back. If he's innocent, I have a question for you. Do you want us to kill you? Or do you want us to let, or are, we, are you going to let us, ha or are you going to apologize to Ron before we kill you? Those are the only do two we, questions but, I do, have. Do you want to try that again? Oh my again? God, I'm still going to kill you when this is all over. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm very excited to watch you try. Daryl, give him the speech from Take It. I don't... <laughs> hit him with the yeah. speech. The skill speech. Guys, I think that maybe we should just cool our jets, so to speak, and then just we'll all decide it after the verdict has been verd. For once, Ron is the voice of reason. Daryl just leans over to Glenn really quick, and he says... Hey, Glenn, I know you were asking last night. I just want to let you know that I think you've tried really hard since we've gone here to be a good dad. And whatever happens, we're here for you till the end. And we will get Nick back and we will get you back. We're not giving up on you. So I put my hand on your shoulder. I say, we got this. Uh -huh. And I'm nodding my head. And while I'm nodding my head, I'm finger tutting to Peyton the message. <laughs> if shit goes bad, cause a scene. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere I go, I cause a scene. He says aloud. Aloud. <laughs> Ron looks at Willie and then looks back to Glenn and whispers. 
if the verdict depends on sort of comparison, like are you a bad dad compared to some other dads, I think that you're going to be innocent for sure. I don't think it is, Ron. <laughs> okay. That's bad news, but I'm... <laughs> shit, buddy. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> so, are you ready for me to call the jury in? Let's do it. Let's do it. Glenn kicks his heels up and is cool as a cucumber, except he's sweating a little bit. <laughs> Jurors! And the door swings open, and 13 extremely attractive, nice, <laughs> extremely cool. <laughs> cool, keep going, keep going, keep going. Just very generous with their time and the amount of investment that they put into this completely voluntary jury process that's not so real and funny, means nothing. So funny, so smart. So the jury comes out. The gelatinous cube of Willie reaches under the dais and pulls out a bunch of dice and says, uh, just to remind you, the way that this works is that each of the arguments that you all put forth, they have a different dice value assigned to them. And I'm gonna roll the ones for prosecution and for defense. And we add all the points together for all the arguments that you had that were declared valid and those are your score for the trial. Whichever team, defense or prosecution has the highest one, wins. If an argument is declared invalid, it's not counted, and it's dice doesn't matter. Uh, so now I want you all to find the file that I just sent you. Yeah, I have it. Oh um, so God, it's called I'm Verdict. So, nervous. Yeah. so one by one, the jurors, each of whom is holding a piece of paper with a particular charge and a particular verdict for that charge on it, one by one, they stand up and they clear their throats to read aloud the charges levied against Glenn Close and their verdict. In the trial of the people of Faerun versus Glenn Close, we, the jury, find the argument Glenn Close committed second-degree murder D12. invalid. Nice, 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 we, nice, the nice. jury, find the argument Glenn was acting for the greater good when he fought the library D6. Valid. Yes. 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 We, the jury, find the argument Glenn hurt a red brand when helping steal the battle axe of hatred D6. <laughs> invalid. Ooh. Oh, man. That's good. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn lets his son smoke pot. D10. <laughs> valid. Yeah, that's valid. Yeah, yeah we've never seen that one coming. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn allowed his son to steal the Honda Odyssey. D6. Valid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, the jury, find Who the argument. This is a very ASMR sultry jury. voice. Glenn compliments others, which is evidence of a good person. D4. <laughs> Invalid. What? No. What? <laughs> Damn, that was the foundation of our we, case. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn reads highlights, which is evident <laughs> for good person. D1. Invalid. What? These are not parents. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn engages in gift exchanges with his son. D4. <laughs> valid. Ooh. That's valid, but not cool. reading good parenting books? Are you kidding me? We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn gave Nick a knife. D2. Invalid. Nice. Okay. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn loves Nick and would die for him. D12. Valid. Oh, okay. okay. man. Right. Good, good, good. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn bets on child fights. D12. Valid. <laughs> Glenn goes like, hell yeah, I do. And I'll do it again. Hey, Glenn, we, the jury, find the argument. Close means family. <laughs> D1. Invalid. <laughs> Damn it. Sorry, Ron. Sorry, Ron. Sorry, Ron. That was a good we, one. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn asked Nick to buy him a $500 drone. D4. <laughs> Invalid. Invalid. Is that for us or them? I can't tell. That's good for us. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn is a cool guy. D8. Invalid. Oh. Invalid. Oh. Throw this case out. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn went to Disneyland without Nick. D8. Invalid. <gasps> good. Because it's on a work day. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn is trying to be good enough for two parents, despite never having had two parents himself. D10. You got this one. Valid. Oh, nice. Go. Good, good, good. Good one, Ron. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn behaves like a friend, not a dad. D10. Valid. Oh. We, the jury, find the argument. <laughs> Nick loves his dad. D12. Valid. Good one. Thanks, audiobook narrator guy. We, the jury, find the argument. Nick can't open up emotionally with his dad. D12. Valid. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn and Nick's love transcends theme parks. D4. <laughs> Valid. There we go. Yes. We got this. We, the jury, find the argument. Glenn has a secret finger language with his son. D2. I don't know about this. <gasps> Valid. Valid. Really? Okay. Nothing wrong with that. On the charge of bad person, we, the jury, find the defendant. D20. Not guilty. <gasps> That's good. That's good. On the charge of bad dad. D20. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. Oh,
So that is all of the charges. Why do they all have so much better voices than we do? <laughs> yeah. And pick us off the fucking podcast. Anthony, we can't play this. All of these jurors have beautiful voices beautiful, I would listen yeah. to for Sexy fucking hours. Sexy ASMR Pretty voices. Embarrassing. Yeah. Pretty embarrassing for us. At some point, we have to catalog all of the discussion that they had in the Discord because it was like literally by the end of the first day, there were people thrown around the fucking trolley problem. It was awesome. Oh, they were man. talking about human morality. They were talking about parenthood. Oh, no, it's like so you cool. can tell. You can tell just by their voices that they were like serious. Yeah, yeah they serious. did not fuck great. around. There were so many UK people, and I feel so bad for every accent that I've ever done on the show. <laughs> and they were really good. So, some. What does that mean? So, what that means is now it's time to roll the dice for each valid argument. So, the valid arguments and their dice rolls. The sum total for the defense is a D six, a D four, a D twelve, a D ten, a D twelve a D4, a D2, and a D20 for a maximum possible score of 70. Okay. Due to objections, the defense gets an extra D8 die, and Willie is going to roll those dice in front of you, and you get a 29. Holy! Oh, no! no. fucking no. kidding me? No, 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 that is so bad. Oh, my God. <laughs> you got a three on your D20 roll. Fudge! No. You didn't get a single dice roll over nine, unfortunately. God. Actually, over seven. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, Shit. so the prosecution gets a D10, a D6, a D10, a D12, and a D20 for a maximum possible score a 58. This is like a wash. This is basically a wash right now. And the prosecution gets an extra D4 for the objections that they raised. To remind you, the defense, you rolled a 29. The prosecution rolls. I'm a betting man. Hit me. A 32. <gasps> Are you kidding? Oh my god! So Willie, the most shit-eating grin, appears uh. off his face, and he goes, "Bill, come in here, Bill!" And the door opens, and Bill, who was like freezing and cold, and like walking in, I want to see if he's holding the gavel. Yeah, like yeah. the moment he comes in, I'm already. Does looking. he have it? He does. Okay, he's got the gavel in his hand, and I go, "Now, Payton." And Payton goes, "Uh, uh, fuck y'all, fuck y'all, fuck y'all." He takes a couple knives and he just starts slicing at the air randomly. Henry finds. Okay, are we? We're just going. I, that's why right. you can do what you want. I'm just saying, Daryl. Saying vines. Do we have all of our weapons and stuff or no? No, it's in the pile. No, they're all we in that anything. pile. Uh, next <laughs> but you got your magic. I've got my spells. And there's a big dragon here too, a big golden ancient dragon oh, who is shit. the bailiff. Don't forget. The dragon's challenge rating. Remember, challenge rating being, hey, four people of this level should be able to fight me and have it be challenging and fun is 22. So if you were all level 22, it would be a fair fight. My thought is just to get the gavel and then I guess we'll figure out what happens to the dragon. <laughs> We're not in Balia. He's walking in. He's not expecting Henry just to do a spell. Like, right. I feel like we get one thing before a battle starts. You basically get a sneak attack if you're in a dupe something. And then we'll go into initiative. You're saying we get a surprise round. Yeah, you get a surprise round. That's what it is. As he whispered vines, honestly, I'm just enraged. Daryl's already picking up a chair because he gets bonuses on spontaneous weapons that aren't like actual weapons. Improvised so grabbing, weapons. Improvised weapons. Thank you. That's the word. He's grabbing one of the wooden weapons. chairs. And I think he's going to charge at Bill. Okay, let's fucking go. Let's do it. <laughs> I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we should at least try to grab Dad that gavel. Dad boys for life. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Dad <laughs> boys for life. This was a miscarriage of justice. He was clearly not guilty. This is some bullshit dice This roll. is a miscarriage of justice. He is clearly a bad person and a good father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After that banger of a closing argument, they were like, nah, the other one. <laughs> the literally exact opposite. <laughs> What's the effect of Payton's attempt at causing a shitstorm? I feel like it's helping the surprise round element of it because they're all looking at him. So if there's going to be something you would do that I would usually say bullshit, they're all looking at you. I'm going to let you get away with it. All right. I'm going to cast Entangle. A creature in the area when you cast a spell must succeed on a strength saving throw. Who is doing that? Uh, Bill? I am casting that on Bill. So what saving throw does uh, Bill have to pass? It's a 17. Okay, so he gets a ooh, 16. Ooh, so yes. he is entangled by vines. He is not moving. And as that happens to him, he goes, wait, what happened? Is he guilty or not guilty? What's, what's, what's going on? I charge him. I go, sorry, I need that gavel, Bill. And then I grab the gavel. The color drains from Bill's face and he goes, you lost? And he opens his hand and the gavel just like is sitting there. So you just take it with no problem. It's just in your hand. I go, thanks, sir. And then I throw the chair over the head of the dragon. Just hoping that he's going to like follow it like a dog to a boat or something. I'm just kind of realize I don't have to hit him. So I'm just throwing the chair. If he gets anything other than a natural one, he's not going to fall for that. Yeah, no, he just is continuing to stare at you and his eyebrows furrow. I slipped. <laughs> I, slipped. I slipped. And so I'm going to go. Wait, wait, okay, all right. And then I throw the rolling pin at Radio Lab. Make a ranged attack. 
Just a, you know, you guys didn't get my joke. Oh, is that a Radio Lab joke? I it's the intro of Radio. Like, wait, oh. wait. Mm, okay. <laughs> all right. Oh, that's all right. And now you're going to throw it at Radio Lab. And take this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to burn my inspiration on that three. Oof. So that's going to be a 14. It's not going to do any damage to him because his armor class is way higher than 14. He's a dragon. But it does bonk into him, and you did technically hit him with it. So he does. And by the way, per the rules of the thing, I'm now having, I looked down, I'm like, oh, it's cool. I got an apron. It says kiss the chef on it now. <laughs> yeah, you see that the, the very bottom, the tails of it are lightly brushing against your face-off boots that your feet are still in. Oh, shit, we're still in face-off oh, boots. Yeah. Right. The shit. The dragon goes two-dimensional, very suddenly, in a kind of cute way. Like, it's boop, there's less detail to it. It's two-dimensional. It's the kind of thing that you can oh, easily... Oh, is it like a cool, like, pixel art? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm so into PS that ape. one Spyro. <laughs> well, that's not 2D. That's shitty poly 3D. Dang, Beth, how does it feel to get dunked on by your DM so well, hard? Well, it feels bad because I know everything about video games and I'm a gamer girl. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to selling your bath water. <laughs> so, yeah, the dragon is now two-dimensional and it goes... Now what? We've got the gavel, right? I think it's time to run. I think Ron is going to try to steal the thing so that we can take it the with coaster. us. coaster. Yeah, the coaster. Ah, yes. <laughs> oh, the coaster, right? We do need the coaster, too. Yeah. All right. Describe how you're going to do that. Um, Let's see. So I'm in front of the big booth. <laughs> Or the judge. The booth, yep. Yeah, the judge yeah, booth. The, judge, the judge booth. And a big handsome boy with a chair ran and a dragon turned to a dimension. So a bunch of stuff's been distracting, I would say. Okay, so I grab uh, one of the cups of water that they give everybody yes. on the table and they're always sipping water before asking questions. So I take one of the glasses and I sneak over to the big booth where my dad is and I set the glass down on the <laughs> other side of the coaster so that one might be like, Hey, who put that glass there without a coaster? And then while he's looking that way, I'm going to grab the actual coaster, the judge coaster, and I'm going to run away. I like this because it's a very strange version of the Indiana Jones yes. swap accepted in <laughs> <laughs> Which we all remember worked out very well for Indiana Jones. Go ahead and roll a sleight of hand. A sleight of hand, not self? No. You're oh. using your hands to exchange one thing with another cleverly. He's giving you free stealth to get up there without being noticed. Okay, yeah. you know, I get that. That's okay. Oh, yeah. <gasps> yes, I got a 19. You got a 19. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you manage to pull the, it's actually, it's glued to the stand, <laughs> but you're, you're, you <laughs> <laughs> but you manage to get your fingers around it and you can pull if you can successfully perform a strength check on your next turn you can yank it out of there but you expect it to come off way easier okay <laughs> it's okay Ron Daryl's gonna help Daryl's gonna help I gotta say that makes sense cause it gets banged by a gavel it would That's fly true. around if yeah. it wasn't glued down true. of course Sam but they don't have wood glue in the Forgotten Realms so. yeah, yeah. Be too yeah. let's hope it's not stronger than the wood itself <laughs> <laughs> exactly now we're into proper initiative order roll initiative I get advantage on initiative cause that's a 20 for Matt. 15 plus 3, that's 18. I got a 16. 10 plus 5, 15. First up is the dragon. Uh-oh. And the dragon uh, <laughs> kills everyone. Begins to inhale, and its pixelated lungs begin to get a little bit bigger. And then Willie goes, uh, 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 hold your turn. Hold on. Uh-oh. Just what? a second, buddy. Oh, no. no, no. And so the dragon, like, pauses and stops his attack. So he's going to hold his turn. He's going to go at the end of initiative now. Now it is Daryl's turn. Okay. Is the fire 2D when he breathes? I, I, what I was like, I'm like, I refuse to believe that the dragon can breathe fire in 2D. There is no the scientific is way it can happen. <laughs> um, oxygen molecules are three-dimensional. Yeah, this, this, is, this is all based on the dragon not being able to do anything. So this may have been a big mistake. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Before he does it, just so it's fair when you know. He can breathe fire, but it's going to come out as 2D. It's not going to be vertically 2D. It's going to be horizontally 2D. So it's Ooh. still going to go out in an arc. But you okay. could hypothetically, with a deck save, jump above it or below it, let's say. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> It's like a laser beam. You know what? It's, it's the fucking The Who's laser beams. You know what I'm talking about from <laughs> yes. the concert film? Yes. <laughs> it's going to be that. You know, the ones they borrowed for Alien is that. I knew Will would like that one. <laughs> That's good. That's a good one. All right. So it is Daryl's turn. So this booth that the thing's glued to, it's just like a wooden platform? Yeah, it's a big wooden podium thing. You have to walk up a few stairs to get up. Is there any decorations? Is there any like old candlestick holders? Yeah, sure. There's some on the side of it. Why not? And there's a seal of the meth big court system emblazoned and glued onto the front That's of the dais. It's just a guy doing a fucking line. <laughs> Henry gives Daryl a look that means Daryl shout. I sentence the dads away from here and then slam the gavel and then it'll suck us away from here. 
Okay, right? so yeah, like, so I got... Yeah, you got the gavel. Who needs to steal the coaster? Just hit the okay. gavel on the coaster. I thought so the coaster was going to be important. <laughs> <laughs> as, I, as I run, I pick up a big candlestick and I scream at the dragon. We got no problem with you, Radio Lab. And then I take the gavel and I say, "Thanks, Ron, for putting your hand there. So I have a better. It's easier for me to aim. It was hard to see beforehand because wood looks like wood, but your nice white skin makes a perfect target. So this wood is, this is super looks easy. like wood. <laughs> wood looks like wood, but this is super easy to hit now. Who it's like it's thought? like the Titanic scene, right? I brought that up before. And then I slam the gavel down. And I say, "I declare all the dads innocent," and I sentence us to get out of here and then we go home but here and we all live happily ever after (laughs) that is certainly what you intend to do as you lift the gavel and you begin to say those words very much like in the scene from liar liar where the pen is royal blue (laughs) no you find that you cannot say a legally untrue thing you know you feel in your heart with this thing in your hand with this pure artifact of law that you cannot give a false verdict and that the true verdict is Glenn Close is guilty. As I'm saying it, because I feel like I said a lot before I slammed it down. Sure. So I feel like as I was trying to say something and I couldn't say something, I just would stop trying to slam it down. Okay. So you're just holding up in the air and you're not, and you're trying you say two syllables and then nothing else comes out. And then I stop and I realize I can't do it. Daryl, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's going on? I go, I took I can't say anything. So then I use my second action. I use the candlestick and I bring it down onto the podium to try to smash it into pieces so that we can just have the coaster and run. Trying to break the coaster free. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Give me a melee attack on the coaster. On some wood. On some wood. This is why I love Dungeons and Dragons. You can go from you fight a gold dragon with all of your spells to one guy hits wood with a candlestick. I'm trying to get the coaster. <laughs> coaster <laughs> stuck to the table. <laughs> and I get plus seven. So that is... Uh, You're going to hit it. Okay, fuck it. Yeah, you yeah. just smash the coaster free you hit the dais with a candelabra and the coaster comes free uh, it's got splintered bits of wood off the bottom but yeah it is now free if it's more i just scream at ron to run ron it is your turn i grab the coaster and then i try to run i guess <laughs> okay except i see it i'm a lot more confident about it like i grab the coaster <laughs> and i run <laughs> <laughs> All right, you managed to dash 30 feet and you are now at the entrance or the exit, I guess, to uh, the courthouse. You can see daylight. You can see the Western style doors. You're right. Maybe next I should have passed this the... coaster to somebody else. <laughs> no, you're good. I feel like okay, Andy's playing good. with us like a fucking cat with a mouse. I though. know. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, it's your turn. <sighs> OK, so Henry sees his comrades jetting for the door. Something goofy happened with the coaster. He's going to... Where's Peyton? (laughs) Peyton is down on the floor in front of the judge's stand, just sitting there throwing knives randomly at the walls. (laughs) What a champ. I feel like he's doing knife juggling, and occasionally he, like, drops it. He's like, oh, 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 and, like, it almost hits him. All part of the show, folks. (laughs) (laughs) Henry's going to turn into a kangaroo and grab Peyton and put him in his pouch and hop out of the courtroom. (laughs) This is my dream! (laughs) You put Peyton into your pouch. He's got his little hands on the outside lip of the pouch. <laughs> you you both start to hop away. And so you're right next to Ron in the six seconds this takes. So you're both at the exit to the room. So now it's the gelatinous cube with the projection of Willie's turn. You just see Willie smiling really big. No. And he goes, we, the court of Meth Bay, find you, the defendant, Glenn Close, guilty. And as he says the word guilty, you feel, Daryl, the gavel in your hand it begins to vibrate and it begins to charge up with a surge of pure elemental law and it shoots out of your hand or tries to shoot out of your hand. Make a disadvantaged strength check. You're going to have to be make a Thor's hammer check. You're going to have to beat a 21. It's just like the hammer from Thor. Wait, disadvantage. Okay, wait, let me see. What, I got strength stuff. Marvel, Thor. I gain advantage on strength checks. Okay, so the advantage, the disadvantage cancel each other out. So just give me a usual strength check. Okay, so I got to hit a 21. Yeah. <sighs> I got a 12. No! A 12? I got five plus seven. The gavel shoots out of your hand. Can I try to, like, block the coaster? Sure. Okay. You're holding it. How are you going to block it? Maybe I just... Drop and curl up. (laughs) Yeah, maybe I just, like, drop it, put my feet on it, and curl up over it. You're going to go, like, do the fetal position over the thing. (laughs) Yeah. Am I going to (laughs) die? (laughs) <laughs> this was your choice the gavel shoots out of daryl's hand it screams toward the coaster as it does so you throw the coaster down immediately covering it with your body it veers upward stops in midair does a 180 so that the hammer of it is pointing downward and comes screaming down at you 
and hits you square in the back, and you hear a horrible crunch, and you take... <gasps> Real sad that I'm about to you die here. You take 25 damage. Oh! You know what's fucking crazy, dude? What? This is like that moment where Batman breaks his back. <laughs> like Bane. You Whatever you gotta Batman's do to deal with the back. fact that you're it about to fucking really die, cool, Freddy. but now it's not cool. So the cavalry comes down, smashes her back, and you feel some vertebra <laughs> pop. Wait, wait, and hold on. Anthony, Anthony, I think it's only fair that Beth gets to roll one luck roll to see if it does fix like a pop in the back and it just makes him feel a little better. There. Yeah, go ahead. It's like in James of the Giant Peach when the centipede is getting stretched. Yeah. Give me a luck roll. Give me a d20. If you get an 18, 19, or 20, then you feel a little bit better weirdly. And you get like advantage on decks or something, right? You can touch your toes all of a sudden. <laughs> like prior to this, you weren't able to touch your toes, but then you're like, I can touch my toes. Then. That's a nine. So no, <laughs> it hurts. So it hurt really bad. <laughs> hey, worth a shot. And it can tell that it didn't make it to the coaster. So it zooms back up nice. and is preparing to zoom back down again. Oh, shit. So now it is Bill's turn. Oh, shit. He goes, fuck, fuck. Uh, 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 so, so if they're guilty, if they're guilty, then uh, the sentencing, that's, that's got to be a later session, right? So like in a week or something, right, Willie, right? And Willie just goes, no, 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 no. We're doing it right here, right now. These fellas wanted to get rowdy, so we're just going to go ahead and do it right now. And Bill's like, oh, fuck, fuck. I wish I could do something, but I'm fucking entangled. And so he's going to try to do a strength check to get out of the roots. This is all Henry's fault. I look at Bill and I say... <laughs> Wait one turn, Bill, and I might be able to fix that for you. He tries to point with his restrained finger at Radio Lab, and he goes, hey, cool it. And he's going to roll. <laughs> Calm down. Persuasion. And uh, with his restraint, he doesn't have the body language that usually makes him so persuasive in these situations. And It's so, a hip thrust. It's a hip thrust, thing, by the way. Yeah. It's a hip thrust thing. And he can't do it. So his attempt to cool down Radiolab does not work. Damn. Now it is Glenn's turn. I'm going to cast a spell that I've learned. Oh, shit. Called Auto's Irresistible Dance on the Dragon. Choose one target I can see within range, the gold dragon. The target begins a comic dance in place, <laughs> shuffling, tapping its feet, and capering for the duration. A dancing creature must use all its movement to dance without leaving its space and has disadvantage on dexterity saving throws and attack rolls. While the target is affected by the spell, other creatures have advantage on attack rolls against it. As an action, the dancing creature makes a wisdom saving throw to regain control of itself. And the way that this works canonically is Glenn like unveils like the thing that he's been working on this whole time, which sure. is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the song Freestyler by the Bomb Funk MCs? I most certainly do not. No. No. It's like freestyler. We're going to rock the microphone. Words cannot describe how little I care about that in this moment. What, what, do you, what happens? <laughs> so by rapping the song Freestyler, the dragon dances. Okay, great. The song Freestyler by Bonfo MCs makes the dragon dance, and now the dragon can't do anything. So the dragon, which is a 2D pixelated dragon, dances in the way that they would dance in an old NES game with no additional animation sprites. So it just kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> it like rotates 45 degrees to the cool. left, and rotates 45 degrees to the right, and then slides three degrees to the left and slides back to where it was. It is Peyton's turn, and he goes, uh, What do I do? What do I do? He was in the kangaroo pouch. Oh, yeah, right. I forgot. He's in your kangaroo pouch. Yeah, yeah. So he just uh, he spends his whole turn going, I love this. This is great. <laughs> He's hanging out. This is where I belong. I feel very safe. Now it's the dragon's turn. So the dragon looks at Willie and he goes, What do I do? And Willie goes, get my kid off the thing. And so the dragon goes, all right. And for its action, it's going to first try to stop dancing. And it is going to roll a wisdom, wisdom saving, saving throw, DC 15. 15. Yep. All right. Okay, it rolled an 18. So it immediately stops dancing yeah, to fuck. every, to Peyton's disappointment most of all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was Peyton's turn. Peyton was watching this toothy dragon and dancing. Like, he was like, yeah. Yeah, with his little hands outside of the pouch. Oh my I'd, God. A oh dance of dragons. <laughs> <laughs> and then the dragon is going to, in one very large stride, move right up to where Ron is. He spent his actions, so we can't do anything, but he's right there and he's looming over you. So you've got a massive dragon and a magical justice gavel over your back, Ron. And I have uh, nine <laughs> HP left. So. Oh my God. How big is the door? I feel like we can just get out of the door frame. I feel like the dragon doesn't have the mass to smash through a door frame anymore. Anthony. That's nice. It's your turn, so you can put that to the test if you want to. I'm still at the front of the courtroom. I can run 40 feet because I got I'm a special fast boy now. Okay. <laughs> what I want to do is I want to run. I'm gonna push Ron off of the gavel coaster, hold it myself, and that's it. That's essentially what I want to do. 
Okay. Seeing that Ron got smashed by the gavel and seeing the gavel getting ready for another smash, I dive and skid across the floor like a cool John Woo movie, and I say, Ron, roll, and I push Ron off the coaster, and in one cool movement- You say, Ron, roll, and then you push him off anyway. <laughs> I push him off anyways, and then I grab the coaster- so cool, Daryl. Ow. <laughs> Dude, Ow. I grab the coaster, and I curl up. The coaster's between me and the candlestick. I'm holding it all really tightly, and I'm getting ready to dive out of the way. I'm staring at the gavel. Like, I'm up holding the coaster with the candlestick, staring up at the gavel. In a way, we all are. <laughs> I thought that was I'm so just a man funny. looking I'm at a so, woman. I'm sorry. I'm going to think about that all the time. I think that is so funny. Okay. It is now your turn, Ron. Ideas sought here. I'm thinking about like, what's a good way that we could destroy this? <laughs> I think it's less about destroying the coaster than getting out of here. Okay. Then I think that I will just try to go out, try to r- escape. Clear the way a little bit? Yes. Trip the dragon or something or do something maybe? I don't know. I just feel so oh, injured. What if you rolled up the dragon like a burrito? 2D should mean it has zero mass, by the way. <laughs> That's oh. Because it's not paper. Paper is three-dimensional. Straight up, you said two-dimensional. That means there is zero mass to this thing it whatsoever. It also means you can't interact with it in a 3D way like rolling it up like a burrito. So his fire couldn't interact with us either. <gasps> Lawyer. Now his fire still going out at an angle. <laughs> Guys, Anthony's being a real good sport right now. Let's. I feel like I'm being pretty nice. <laughs> I think we are trying our best to fight out of here. No, I I appreciate the way that you're trying. I don't think to we're fight cheating out. on anything. I think we're just trying. I will to- say though, you probably can't roll a dragon up as a burrito because the edges are two dimensional, so it would be infinitely sharp. So you would danger just slice your fingers off. That's Damn, true. yeah, you I wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, that's the argument I'm making with the fire is that it's effectively not actually a fire that's coming at you. It is an infinitely it's sharp, giant blade. like sudden blade coming at you. Okay. Well, except the problem also is that fire in and of itself is a massless thing, right? <laughs> It's a combustion, no, it's so it actually isn't. It has, has mass. mass. Of course, Does it fire is. have yes, mass. Gas has mass. <laughs> no, fire is a chemical process. Fire is glowing gases. Uh, yeah, g- in gases, this world, which a has mass. Rune, when something is two dimensional and it casts fire, that fire still can hurt. Freddie, this isn't a cut twice thing. Gas has mass. According to Cora, you're both right. Does fire have <laughs> mass? The most no, Henry fire move. Is a chemical process, so it doesn't have mass. However, flames have mass because they are composed of a complex <laughs> mixture of gases and particulate solids, which each have mass. So, in a way, you're both right, boys, and you're both wrong. So, you know, I think we all learned something well, here. Today. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, Ron, what are you going to do? I don't even think there's anything cool that I can do. <laughs> I, just, I, I mean, I think the option is like either run or try to distract the dragon and run is my thought, but I don't know. Okay, then I'll use do. the daddy's home cantrip yes, to nice. use Willie's voice to tell the dragon, destroy the hammer. Okay, give me a persuasion roll. That's a 10. Ah, so 10 is not it. going to do it, unfortunately. Uh, the dragon begins to flinch at the sound, and then it turns and looks at the gelatinous cube. The hologram's mouth isn't moving, and it just says, ah, it's nothing. Uh, bad connection. I better destroy <laughs> this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it is Henry's turn. And so I, I can't leave either. You can move. I'm Sorry, you can also move. Okay. That was an action. You can also move. Okay, cool. I'm just going to try to run away. <laughs> okay. You are now outside of the courthouse. Feels good, man. <laughs> you taste freedom. You're like Nicolas Cage at that part in Con Air where the wind hits his face. Yeah. Or Nicholas goes to the part in Face Off where he gets out of the Erewhon prison and it's the first second, but then a helicopter shows up. Oh, man. Daryl sees Ron running. He's like, tell Grant I love him if we don't make it out of here, Ron. If we don't make it out, my back is broken. I know. I'm I'm sorry, buddy. No, it's okay. (laughs) All right. It is Henry's turn. Uh, Wow. What a day, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Henry is going to cast one of his new fifth level spells called Gesh. I wonder if you can guess what this is going to do. God. God. Yes. Um, Gesh is- Speak like uh, Sean Connery. It makes you speak like Sean Connery. And because you're speaking like Sean Connery, it allows you to place a magical command such as punch the keys or bolt the door if you're coming in. <laughs> On a creature that you can see within range, forcing it to carry out some action or refrain from some action or course of activity as you decide. So basically, I can make it do something. I mean, I feel like that's what you wanted me to do. And so you didn't tell me that that's what you had the power to do. So. Well, good. Well, I was like, I was like, two chances. No, I get it. I get it. It's good to have multiple chances. It is. What a day, huh? <laughs> So Henry gets like super serious and he points at the dragon and says, no, really, destroy the hammer. That's as scary as he could sound. That was so. pretty persuasive. <laughs> How does the spell work? The dragon needs to make a wisdom saving throw. He rolled a natural 20. <laughs> oh. Damn. All right. Well, shit. That's Henry's spell, and it didn't work. Do you kangaroo hop away, Will? 
Oh, I had to teach kangaroo to do that, so I'm no longer a kangaroo. <laughs> what are you just holding pain like an epiphany? Pain, pain immediately is like, no, <laughs> I was so happy. It's the cube's turn, and so Willy looks at you and he goes, I guess see you later, kiddo. And the gelatinous cube reaches under the desk with a single globby tentacle and pushes a button, the same button that was pressed when you very first came into this place. And the doors to the front of the room slam shut. Oh, shit. And now you are all trapped. Crushing another crushing, person. Yeah, well, they learned to get out of the way, so nobody gets crushed. But you are now trapped inside with everybody else, and Ron is on the outside. <laughs> the gavel is once again going to come screaming down at the coaster, which is being held exactly how? Like, I'm holding the candelabra and the coaster to my chest, but obviously the coaster is touching my chest and the candelabra is above it. Like, I'm also staring at it, so I want to be able to do a deck. Like, I'm ready to, like, roll out of the way. You can give me a regular dexterity, but it's just going to be a very high check. That's a four plus a one. The gavel comes in towards your chest. You juke a little bit to the left and it just poof, like jukes over exactly identically as you're doing it. Like it doesn't even obey the laws of momentum. And it's going to do what I'm basically saying is that this thing is 3D 12 worth of damage. And I'm going to say candelabra reasonably. You could expect it to have like 14 hit points. OK, so it does 19 hit points. It shatters the candelabra against your chest. The shards go everywhere and it <laughs> hits the coaster in the center of your chest and in that moment time stops you all find yourselves in a void that is both black and white that is both light and dark that is both up and down that is perfectly balanced that is the rules of existence and reality come to a beautiful head you are within the very nature of justice and a guy that looks exactly like brian Ferenzi steps out and he says i am the law <laughs> <God damn it. laughs> you fucker <laughs> glenn you have been pronounced guilty i'm the spirit of the gavel you have two choices as was mentioned earlier you can either, in this instant, magically lose control of your son and be instantly teleported to the meth Bay Supermax to live out the rest of your days, or we can teleport all of you right back to where you are and the dragon can finish its job of immolating you and putting you to death. Mm. So you have one of these two choices and you have to make one of these choices. I've got a question. So with the choice that he loses his son and is confined to prison. Isn't the losing your son not, like, alterable? Correct. There's nothing that you can do ever that will change the fact that Nick will lose all of his memories of you as his father. He will have a new father. There's nothing magically that you can do to change that. Even if you found a way to go back in time and change that, you would find a timeline where he'd grown up with this other person. You will invariably and inviolably not be your son anymore. I think that deep down, oh man, this is very complicated because like, I think that for Glenn, he cares about Nick, probably more than anything else. He cares about Nick because this is like the one piece of his relationship that he had with Morgan that is like the thing that lives on, right? So that's pretty hardcore, the idea of losing Nick forever. But then he also knows that that's a possibility because there's no guarantee we go back and we win this fight. Like, we could go back, Glenn gets to keep his kid, but Glenn might die. Nick grows up an orphan. Nick loses both of his parents. So deep down, I think he's going to take the option to go into prison and to lose Nick because at least in that scenario, he can live with the idea at least Nick grew up with a father. But in the other one, he can't go look down that abyss again and risk, because he knows deep down that Nick was affected by Morgan's death, even though he doesn't say anything. He's smart enough. He's an adult. And to potentially subject Nick to that would truly make him a bad father. He'll take the sure thing of life in prison, and Nick at least has a life and a father that he loves over the possibility of subjecting Nick to losing another parent. And so he says, the first thing you said, please. <laughs> All right. So the law nods solemnly at you. It claps its hands. And in that instance, everything goes white. Wow. 
Glenn, when you next open your eyes, you are in a cell, alone, back in the Meth Bay Correctional Facility, a cell that's guarded by two very burly guards with spectral security cameras watching you, basically just big spectral eyes that are standing in the jail cells. Your boots are extra heavy and weighted down. Your arms are chained to the wall. This is quite a bit for a cool dude who's clearly not like a buff, like flight <laughs> risk. I'm just throwing that out there. If you don't want to take the really cool implication that they're actually scared of you getting out because they think you're clever, then sure, by all means, you're just sitting on a little crappy cot. <laughs> okay, never mind. I back that up. I'm in chains. It's like the fucking cell and Hannibal Lecter, okay, man. It's the Hannibal Lecter mask, plus it's the jail from the end of X-Men, so it's like the Magneto oh jail too, because of that's how our two security guards, one that has the food, he's like, no man, you give him the yeah. food. Like, no, yeah. you give him exactly. the food. And then he pushes the other one in, they quickly slide the what food under your thing. What if he tells me thing. to cool it? Well, I don't know if he told, he's not going to tell you to cool it. <laughs> the other dads, when you open your eyes, you find yourselves around a campfire, and the first thing you're, you see when you open your eyes are your own children. You see Walter the Bullywug. He's not my kid. I said and. I'm sorry. <laughs> you immediately, by instinct, think, where's Nick? And you turn and you look and you see Nick, and Nick is laughing so hard. Uh, and you notice that immediately he's not wearing the clothes that feel like a younger kid's version of Glenn's clothes. He's wearing a polo. He's wearing khakis. Oh Looks like a God. fucking nerd. Zorasa. <laughs> <laughs> a visually similar handsome man slaps him on the back, and he goes, Because he was on duty. <laughs> Yeah, I know, duty, right? Oh, man, I love it. I love it. I love you. And that voice you just heard belongs to Jimmy Wong, Freddie Wong's real-life younger brother. What? <laughs> no. What? Oh, no. <laughs> what? Yes. Holy shit. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. <laughs> Dungeons and Daddies is Matt Arnold as Daryl Wilson, Anthony Birch as our DM, Will Campos as Henry Oak, Beth May as Ron Stampler, and myself, Freddie Wong, as Glenn Close. Special guest Jimmy Wong with a brief cameo there at the end, and you can expect to hear more of him in the episodes to come. Theme song and outro is All Right by Maxton Waller. Courtney Therond is our content producer. Ashley Nicolette is our community manager. Robin Rapp is our transcriber. This episode could not have happened without our jury of 13 individuals drawn from our Patreon ranks. We want to thank them for diligently deliberating all the finer points of this trial on the private Discord over the past two weeks. So, in no particular order, thank you to Caitlin Marquard, Theo, R, Chris Ruger, Stock Bach McGock, Eric Gilbert, Rebecca Maloney, Chris Wading, Laura Loveless, Kelly Carmine, Shani Polwyn, the mysterious juror number 12, and juror number 10. In addition to these sort of wild gameplay experiments, you can get a peek behind the scenes and access to exclusive bonus content on our Patreon at patreon.com slash dungeons and dads. There you can join people like Jeremy Tisdale, Duncan Watson, Elizabeth Fulmy, Samantha Humphrey, Elliot Roberts, Dylan J. Johnson, Elizabeth Singer, Colby Rice, Drew Pat, and Jess Backstedt, and get access to an entire backlog of bonus content. We're recording our next Stretch Goal bonus miniseries this month. It's going to be a Star Wars themed miniseries about a jizz band that knew too much. If you don't like subscribing to Patreons, you'll be able to get it eventually as a digital download, just like our previous mini series at the Mountains of Dadness. But if you're a Patreon, you get it first and you get it free. You can also get discounts on our merch store over at store.dftba.com. We have an incredible new sticker pack for sale, including a West Rock Elementary Doodlers bumper sticker and an amazing looking everything is going to be OAK poster. So head on over there. Check it out now. Store.dftba.com. Follow us on Twitter, Dungeons and Dads, reddit.com slash r slash Dungeons and Daddies for our subreddit. This is going to be the last main episode of the year. We have a little bonus the week of Christmas, but we'll be back with a new main episode to kick off year three of Dungeons and Daddies on January 12th. 
patrons will continue to get new content throughout this month, so don't worry there. But as we barrel headlong into the holidays for some much needed R&R on a very strange year indeed, we want to take a quick moment to thank you all for your support, for listening, for passing the show along to your friends, and for all the amazing discussion and fan art along the way. We hope that in return we've given you some quality audio entertainment for your ear holes, maybe even inspired some of you out there to pick up some dice, maybe try DMing yourself. We have a blast making this show. We hope you've had a good time, whether you've been listening from the first episode or just picked this up. So truly, thank you all for taking the time and listening to our little show. We'll see you next year, and I think you're going to definitely want to hear the Easter egg on this episode. Okay, bye! There was a time when you could read between the lines You know they never brought you down Never brought you down I'm sharing you all on some documents. So what was going to happen was if you chose to try to fight the dragon and you died, then I was going to say, OK, here's another choice for you. Glenn is somewhere on the infernal plane because he was killed by a dragon's fire. His soul has been transported to the infernal plane, which is a place. Don't look at the files yet, right. which was a place that is made for and by the worst people in the history of time and space. It is the most awful place you can imagine. So if you want to go to the infernal plane and try to get him out, you can. But I promise you, you are not going to like it. You were going to be angry at me for even giving you this option. You're going to be angry at yourselves for taking it. And then if you said yes, I would say, okay, I've shared you all on character sheets that you're going to need to look at. So you all descend into hell and then you have to double click hell music. And I would say, Glenn, you feel your hair begin to grow curlier around you. Oh, no. And Ron, you feel your face begin to deform and a, a, a hat grows out of your skull. Wait, can I, can I? Yeah, play, oh play the hell God. music this and then look so at your character I'm playing the hell music. I <laughs> And, and you see lights streaming up above you as you move forward through the night and you're like back in your own world and you're confused and you realize you're all in a car together. You're in a beautiful convertible together going down oh Sunset God. Boulevard. As you look up into the lights, you see your own name and you now have to escape Entourage the game. I never watched Entourage as a fucking kid. I, I put that in there as foreshadowing in case I needed to do this. So I'm Johnny Drama Chase, and Anthony gave us, these are the stats he gave us, lying, seduction, toxic masculinity, fame, spending money, and the gym. Which gym was Lauren's idea, which is the fucking, I was like, so like something yeah, physical, so she wouldn't know. Gym. My ability was bro hype, which I can spend a wall buck and intentionally fail a roll to give a bro a plus one die on their next roll. <laughs> My ability is... Fucking piece of shit, garbage, shithole, asshole. Spend a wall buck to gain plus two die if any roll. If you act like a complete piece of shit excuse for a human. Ron is turtle. <laughs> Mine is Vincent Vinny Chase. I'm an actor. Ability, best actor in the biz. And anytime you can spend a wall buck to gain plus two to your lying score, but you must specifically recall a role you portrayed that will help you. You also must perform the signature line from that role. <laughs> I was E. My ability is negotiate a better deal, spend a wall buck to re you check if you don't roll a six treat the result as a one if you ever do something cash money the dm will award you wall buck is very good <laughs> this is insane Anthony. it was literally you know why i did this right is because in that talking dad we were talking about succession and all this that and matt specifically yeah. said i usually try to give these characters the benefit of the doubt but every character in entourage should go to hell and i was in the shower and i was like <laughs> <laughs> Mark my words, Patreon supporters, after we finish the Star Wars miniseries, this is the next stretch goal. The alternate reality of if Glenn had died and the dads had to go rescue him from the Entourage universe. <laughs>